In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Heavenly King, O Comfort of the Spirit of Truth, who art in all places and fillest all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every stain of sin and save our souls, O Good One. Open so fools to salis and alixas, can't a pepsis artist of Nermato. Que di afton, di mi comenis a ginepsas, di lantro Good evening. How are we doing on our first three days of the fast? We're okay. More than a diet? Are we actually fasting from sins? That's the question. I don't know. I don't think I've done much in that, in that way. I hope you do. It, fasting is much more than just changing our diet, right? Fasting is mainly restricting the passions. And the diet is just the most obvious area in which we uh, are most akin, uh, most uh, susceptible to the passions. And so the church changes our diet so that we might restrict our desires. And with that, also restrict our passions and quell our our impulses and our uh, usually our passions are fed by um, the uh, um, unrestricted desires being met, and so that's done usually through food first and foremost. So that's why fasting is important. And more, mainly, it also, before it's even important in terms of actually beating down and overcoming and transforming the passions, it's important, first and foremost, foremost as a expression of our obedience to Christ. So even if we're not fasting strictly, if we're fasting according to the church's teaching, and we do it with great exactitude and, and effort, then this is a great blessing, because... The question of obedience is the foundation, and we, if we're on the, if we're in the, within the spirit of obedience to the church, it, that is a huge, um, the vast majority of the uh, spiritual benefit that we'll get from fasting is from this. Secondarily, it's the question of severity and restriction foods. So we're beginning on the apostles' fast. And we have uh, this year uh, about three weeks on the new calendar, five weeks on the old calendar of the fast. It's interesting to note that the Apostles' Fast was probably the first fast initiated in the church, the ancient church, even before, perhaps even before the fast before Pascha, uh, which uh, developed slowly and came much larger. So this is an ancient fast, and uh, it's very good that... Uh, we observe it uh, mindfully. It's not as strict as the other ones, but nonetheless, it's important. And it also shows how much the church uh, uh, reveres the, pe the persons of the two apostles, Peter and Paul, and also the 12, which are celebrated on the 30th of the month, it reveres their, their, their memory uh, for nothing less than the continuation of the incarnation uh, was... Uh, um, achieved and is continually achieved in each generation by the successors of the apostles. Because what the church is, is essentially our initiation and into communion with God himself. And that's what the incarnation brought to the world. It brought communion with God and man. And what's, that's exactly what happens in the church. So when the apostles are preaching to us and teaching us the way of the cross and resurrection, what they're doing is initiating us into communion with life. Nothing less. Communion with eternal life. And this is the, um, the essence of the incarnation. The, the life of God was uh, incarnate in the life of man, and men were reunited to life. 
And so when we are communion of the Holy Mysteries worthily through fasting, prayer, and obedience to the church, we are being reunited to that life which was initially imparted to the first form, to Adam and Eve, but then was again imparted to man through uh, the new Adam, Christ. So the apostles' work and the apostles of every generation uh, are is really uh, co-workers with Christ, co-workers uh, in the in the initiation of men into communion with God, and this happens nowhere else but in Christ and in Christ's body, the Church. So it's a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous uh, honor and blessing to be uh, for those who are successors of the apostles, but also all of us who are. Uh, disciples of the apostles and I think that this needs to be stressed because we take it for granted we really do take it for granted that we are orthodox Christians and that we have such a great uh, um, cloud of witnesses that uh, have gone before us and we have such a great inheritance which has been which has been given to us so if we can cultivate within us this gratitude during this fast and, and, and meditate on the offering of the holy apostles and what it means to be their disciples, the disciples of their disciples. Uh, this, is a, this would be a great spiritual benefit to us. We won't, we won't pass the summer, uh, as some do, uh, dissipating their spiritual life in um, vain pursuits and uh, passions and, um, and recreation, although that's certainly uh, there is a time and a place for recreation. And it's ne necessary for all of us to take breaks and to recuperate and re-establish um, ourselves and with rest and, and to get out of the, the, the uh, uh, distraction of the world because that's what the, that's what much of us much of our life is today is just one long series of distractions and so we're not living in our heart we're not living in our mind we're living outside Inside ourselves and the various things around us and the images and voices and uh, of work and of uh, TV and of internet and all the rest. And so we spend ourselves actually outside of ourselves. So uh, hopefully this fast and the feast will be a spiritual uh, preparation for a summer spent uh, productively, spiritually, re recuperating, rejuvenating re ourselves spiritually. Uh, through um, uh, going into ourselves, going back into our, uh, our mind, into our heart, and uh, with peace and prayer, but also just uh, external peace. Of the, the hustle and bustle of so much of what is today's way of life, which is distracting. So the, the, the people, the, the two uh, persons of the apostles, let's just talk about that briefly, and then we can all open it up to discussion, which I'm most uh, it's mostly there that we have some great benefit. But the two persons uh, that we're celebrating during this, we're commemorating, commemorating during this fe fast and, and on the feast, uh, Peter and Paul. And it's really providential and interesting that our Lord uh, chose these two as the chief of his apostles, and we celebrate their memory as the chief of the apostles. And for one, on the one hand, you have a simple fisherman who evidently uh, was um, given, let's say, he was, a, he was a natural born leader, but he was also a bit hot headed and uh, struggled with uh, his zeal, not according to knowledge, eventually became according to knowledge. But uh, that was part of his uh, not having sufficient self-knowledge. So he would, um, on the one hand, the great blessing of proclaiming the divinity of Christ. When Christ asked him, uh, asked all of his disciples, who am I? Who do they say that I am? And Paul, Peter, St. Peter replied uh, after various responses, you're a prophet, you're this, you're that, uh, that you are the Christ. And this was divinely given. This was directly from the Father inspired in his heart. So clearly he had a spiritual he had a spiritual experience and spiritual state to be worthy of that revelation. And upon this revelation, we, uh, the church is founded. The, and the revelation and the confession, I should say, of the divinity of Jesus Christ. Upon this, 
uh, confession is the entire church is founded not on the person of Peter, but on his confession. Uh, and shortly after, um, as the um, time of the Passion approached, and the Lord revealed that this would happen to the Messiah, to the Christ, Peter spoke brashly and said, far be it from, for you to suffer. You are the Messiah. And Christ rebuked him severely with the famous words, get behind me, Satan. So this is the same person that shortly before was inspired by God, divinely revealed and confessed the divinity. And then shortly after is rebuked by the same person, the Lord himself, as, as being under the influence of the enemy of our salvation. Because he was uh, in the spirit of the world. And what is the spirit of the world? That the Messiah should not suffer. That, that Christ should not suffer. That the crucifixion should not happen. Because they did not understand that the, through the crucifixion, death would be put to death. Sin would be overcome. The passions would be allayed. And that humanity would be renewed and rejuvenated and, and, and saved in the person of Christ after the resurrection. So they, 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 were, they were still pre-Pentecost, pre-resurrection, and in the spirit of the world. But you you realize that this spirit is very much alive today. There are many of us in the church who have the same spirit. Many of us who think like Peter before, before the resurrection. And we don't want to talk about suffering. We don't want to see the church and the life of the church as one of uh, pain of heart and maybe even suffering in this world, if God allows it, physically but certainly pain of heart, that much of the spiritual life is painful and that, and that this pain is what purifies. So when we stand and say, why, oh Lord, am I suffering? Or why is so-and-so suffering? Or why did this happen? Uh, we, as, we, we may as, essentially be doing what Peter did, St. Peter did, and say no to the crucifixion, no to suffering. No to the redemption to the cross. Because we don't want to pick up our cross. And we're mumbling and groaning and complaining that life is not fun. We want to have a fun life. Why, is it, why do we have to go through sufferings? Uh, but this is the path that our Lord himself showed us is the path to resurrection and to eternal life. And this sweet joy of being within the, in the will of God. The sweet, quiet hidden joy within the heart, this is what we should seek after and, and treasure. Not the, not the easy, quick uh, joy of fun and excitement and entertainment or the passing, fleeting joy of the pleasures of this world, but the deep joy of eternal life, of love of God, love of the brethren, love of... Um, our husband, our wife, our children, this deep love, which is union and communion. And we can feel that on a human level, and we should seek it on the divine human level in the church. It should be our common uh, daily um, quest to be in that deep, peaceful communion, which is given to those who love the person of Christ. And uh, the person of Christ is revealed in the church. And the life of the church is the life of Christ uh, for those who live it. Uh, of course, there's always temptations and distortions. Even in the time of the apostles, there were great temptations and distortions. The apostle Paul, let's talk about him for a moment. Uh, the apostle Paul, uh, after growing up a devout Jew and persecuting the church through his great zeal for the teachings of the of the pharisees by divine revelation was brought to repentance and became a great apostle i'm not going to recount all the details you can look it up on the synaxarion i think it's important here to talk a little about the spiritual life that's why we're here tonight but you can see that the many details which are very instructive and, and impressive in the synaxarion the life of the saints but the apostle paul uh, after becoming a great Apostle, perhaps one of the greatest, and really, uh, uh, 
you know, uh, left a huge mark on the whole history of the church and the life of the church to the great, uh, you know, surprise, of course, at the time to the other apostles who thought he was initially going to persecute them. Even after his, you know, coming to Damascus, they were afraid. Uh, but what I want to point out is that there's always been within the church persecutions and distortions and temptations. So many of us grow weary of the problems in the church today, but we, if we would le read history and understand what the saints have gone through, we would realize that this is nothing new. The apostle Paul pr was sent to the Gentiles among, after the Jews, he also went to the Gentiles and spent most of his apostleship teaching and preaching to the Gentiles. And he had much opposition from the Judaizers or the Jews who insisted that the Gentiles be uh, receive circumcision uh, and, 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 and keep the, the Sabbath, uh, the old Sabbath and, and, and the teachings of the, uh, the ritual teachings and traditions of the old law. And he fought them uh, left and right throughout his uh, apostleship. Uh, as denying the very um, uh, Lord that they uh, said they had accepted, in insisting that the that which has been done away, which has been fulfilled, be maintained and be be observed. So he saw as the in the implication of their insistence uh, that they were essentially denying uh, the coming of the Messiah and fulfillment of the prophecies and the new life in Christ because of their insistence on the old being maintained. So these are, for us, perhaps some of us would say these are minor issues or uh, there's certainly room for compromise or we could uh, perhaps uh, have some kind of, you know, partial unity with these people, even though they're mistaken. Uh, this is not at all uh, what, how the Apostle Paul saw it, and he set the standard for us that these minor details are extremely important because they reveal a deeper spiritual reality, a deeper spiritual con confusion and, and corruption. And so every diversion from the faith actually reveals not, the issue is not per se the error, which needs to be corrected, but the deeper spiritual reality that brought about the error. The previous problem and that's oftentimes you can find that also in the spiritual life so when you when you find, when you see errors being committed oftentimes there's the in and of themselves the errors are not the problem they're the symptom they're the expression of a deeper spiritual state that we've uh that we're in and so there are many signs in the spiritual life that we need to be cognizant of and 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 take heed that they're pointing to something deeper, uh, and that we're not we're not resisting other passions that 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 are hidden, and so um, delusion, diversion from the faith, false teachings are not in and of themselves the only problem. They're a problem, but they're pointing to a, a spiritual alienation. So uh, even in the St. Paul's time. There were people in the church, fellow believers, who were deluded and were uh, essentially working against the gospel. Now, that's to me, that's amazing, because that's what we're living in the church today. We have many problems in the church with people who are in the church, fellow workers, fellow believers, but they are deluded. They have a, a bought into the spirit of the world and teachings of the uh, heterodox and and they've they've they're actually working against the spread of the gospel and but we can take courage and and to know that the great apostle paul had the same problem and in fact it's very clear that they they were warring against him nearly every stop he made toward the end of his life so this is uh this is the, the nature of things in this world and actually uh they become if we work together with grace, they become, um, they can become for us salvific. Uh, just as suffering is salvific, so these trials and struggles can be salvific for, for us. So everything that's allowed by the Lord is allowed for our salvation. Even that which is uh, inspired by the evil one. This is a great mystery that he is, uh, we would say in Greek, uh, as my elder used to say, o diavolos sino ergo lavos. To, to Theo, didn't they? 
the Lord allows the machinations and of the evil one because even through them he will bring about good for those who believe, for those who have faith, for those who, who are patient. And so there's no reason to become agitated and to be anxious and to be fearful. It's all in God's hands. Even the worst and the most problematic, even at the end times, even when the Antichrist will have come, none of that reality of God's providential care for his people will change. So the fear of, uh, we have to cast out this fear uh, that, that, tr that plagues us and, 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 and be, be courageous. And uh, certainly the apostles, Peter and Paul, are great examples to us and uh, for all of the church uh, throughout all the ages they've, they've stood. So this, this, this fast and feast, let's, uh, let it not be as it is, just unfortunately for many Orthodox Christians today, almost non-existent, almost as if it doesn't exist. For them let it let it not be that for us but let us take advantage of it and study the lives of the apostles reflect on their virtues reflect on how god took these these men one of them who was a, a very simple fisherman he became a god seer and the other who was a persecutor of christ he became the greatest of the apostles it, it, it is very clear that the pedagogy of the lord here is to say that each to each one of us you can be imitators of these apostles none of us are as simple as a fisherman uh, unlettered in 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 galilee in the in, in the first century in terms of worldly knowledge at least which is not that important frankly but we can all uh, become spiritual uh, men and women regardless of our education that's something we can take away from the life of St. Peter if we make progress in faith and repentance. And even those who have denied Christ, fallen away from Christ, uh, worked against the church, persecuted the church. It was the Apostle Paul who stood at the feet of, of those who were stoning the, uh, the deacon, uh, the first martyr, Stephen. He himself was overseeing the martyrdom and was partially responsible for the death of the the, the, uh, the deacon, the proto-deacon, uh, Stephen. So, is there any of us who, who have denied Christ, who have gone against the church, who have fallen into a way of life which is antithetical to the gospel? We need to take courage in the example of the Apostle Paul, the greatest, perhaps the greatest of the apostles, uh, together with St. Peter, and, and, not, and not lose heart, and not uh, lose faith, but... Uh, know that uh, until our last breath, the Lord is awaiting us uh, in ever greater uh, waves of repentance and faith in him. Uh, these are these are great examples, and I hope that uh, we'll have them in mind and be benefited by them and take courage. Uh, I think that's all I want to say tonight. We can go on for a long time, but let's open up the question and answer. We, we can also get into other issues other topics, and you can ask whatever you like. I'm sure there are tons of questions that you could ask if you uh, stop and think about your life and your spiritual life. We all are struggling. All of us have need uh, for guidance, including myself, and I regularly go for guidance to my spiritual father. So go ahead, who wants to ask the first question? Um, my, my question is off topic. Um, um, I'm just wondering about humility. Um, I've heard time and time again that uh, God allows certain things to happen to us, you know, to humble us, to humble us, to humble us. For me, it's not working. For many, many years, the same stuff has been going on and on and on. And instead of me saying, I deserve this, you know, this is my fault. I, I, I'm just so frustrated and I'm sick of it. And I just want to like run away from everything. And I'm not even close to cultivating a very humble spirit. Hmm. Well, that's good that you recognize that. That's the first step. Imagine if you didn't even recognize that and you were uh, insisting that, you know, you do well in resisting these, these uh, opportunities for repentance. So I, don't, I think we need to start where we are. Recognize where we are and start. And that means looking at today, not what happened the last two days, five days, five years, ten years. Not thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow. So looking at today and saying, what can I do today in my situation 
they imitate Christ, they imitate the apostles, they imitate the saints, and that none of it matters at the end of the day. It's all vain and it's falling away. What's going to remain? What's going to remain? Christ and me and my soul. That's what's going to remain. I'm going to be with him eternally, or I'm not going to be with him eternally. So all the other things that happen and come and go are either means to that, or I'm using, I'm not using the opportunities, and I'm losing the opportunity to become in the communion with him. So there's actually nothing. There's not a person on the face of the earth who could say that they don't have the means to come into communion with God. All of us are, from the point of the incarnation onward, all of humanity, even beforehand, all of, all of humanity can approach God and be in communion with him. We have to start, though, right now in this moment in time. You know, the, the great scandal that humanity, much of humanity cannot get their head around is the incarnation, because it was God coming to into humanity, into time and space in a particular place, in a particular time, and living those 33 years on the face of this earth. And that is a crucifixion to the logic of most human beings. They can't get, the, well, to all of human beings, the Christians are the ones who crucify their logic and get beyond it and get and, and move, move ahead of it or higher up in the terms of, of understanding. So on this, in the same way, you and I need to start in this particular time and space that we're in, and we need to connect in that time with human, with God. And there's no other time. So whatever happened, whatever you suffered, whatever you struggled with, whatever you didn't succeed at, it doesn't matter. It's absolutely insignificant at this point. What matters only is what you can do now. And so you make a new beginning. Every day, every moment, make a new beginning. And at this point, from this day forward, what does St. Herman of Alaska say? From this day, from this hour, from this moment forward, let us love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Let us, you know, uh, do the will of God above all else. It doesn't really matter what happened yesterday or the day before. What matters is what's going to do today, tonight. So are you calling on God when you're in these temptations? Are you begging him for his grace are you uh are internally are you living internally are you living in the events are you living in the 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 emotions that come and go and that are that are you know um like the way the sea the sea and the waves of the sea and they're just taking us wherever they take us and now this person came and he's very upsetting and he's provoking me and now the sea of life is pushing me here, and then a little bit later it'll push me there, and so eventually we're essentially we're we're just uh, victims of the events of uh, of other people's doings. And so, I if we don't go internal and pray and ask God, Christ, to help us uh, in that moment to overcome that passion. Then we we won't we won't make any progress. Okay, thank you. Hello, Padre. Curious. Yes. Um, again, just a little off topic. It's um. You guys should all say your names because if we're gonna. Given these talks, you know, God willing, we'll give these talks. I need to get to know you. <laughs> okay, my name is Theo, and I sometimes go there um, whenever I get the day off. So sometimes I sometimes come here whenever whenever I get the day off. Theo, okay. And the young lady before her name was Funny. 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 Okay. Theo and Funny. Okay. So Theodoros. Theo, what's it's your full funny. name? Theopanis. 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 Okay. Uh, I don't know, I'm just a little confused. Uh, this question: Did Jesus and Apostle Paul ever met? Uh, I mean, uh, are, are, there, are there were there around the time the same time? The Apostle Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus when he appeared to him. He never. He, uh, there's no 
no sign of him meeting while Jesus was in the in the flesh before his resurrection. We don't. I don't know of any historical account that would show that he he met Jesus before. You understand the answer? So what's how many years apart? Well, he was persecuting the church almost immediately, so just a few years at the most. I don't know the exact uh, after, after Jesus died, Apostle Paul came alive. The Apostle Paul was alive. He was a young man. He was growing up. He didn't, he did, apparently, he didn't meet Jesus. We don't know. We don't know what happened before. We know that he met him on the road to Damascus when Christ appeared to him and said and and spoke the famous words uh, to him, bringing him to repentance. Uh, that he is. Uh, um, Persecuting me. Why are you persecuting me? He said. And who are you? St. Paul said. I'm Jesus who you persecute. So that's the moment that he he met our Lord. And but many times after that, he talks about going to the third third heaven. So he clearly had a very dynamic relationship with Christ after that. But we don't know in terms of uh the th three years of Christ's ministry on, on earth. I don't know anyway of any never heard of any historical account of him being present at any of the Christ of the master's lectures or teachings or whatever. Did you get the, the answer? Were there, were there any witnesses? Witnesses to what? Uh, Jesus and Apostle Paul together? Yes, the people with him on the road. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, sorry to ask you those kind of questions because eventually there are other religions of uh, uh, believe that they never met. So well, they don't. Was, they, don't trust, they don't trust the scriptures or Saint Paul. Then, so why should we listen to them? Should we? Why should we trust yeah. them and not the scriptures that say clearly that they met? Okay, well, basically, I. Can't, I barely cannot read the uh, uh, scripture through the fact I have a dyslexia. That's why I need, I have some sort of dyslexia and I may okay. understand wrong. That's why. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's fine. That's, that's why, that's why I need like a, you know, from, yeah, yeah, from, yeah, from clarification from you guys. Okay. So that's, that's the witness of the scriptures. It's the witness of the fathers, witness of the St. Paul himself that they met. And here's another. Um, I also got another question. This um, this kind of salted me away. You know the movie Malcolm X back in '92. They were saying that the when Malcolm X became a new convert of Islam, the nation of Islam, which is black black supremacists, um, they say that the, inside the scriptures they never say that Jesus is not white and he's not blonde hair, blue eyes. What is he really? Even the born again Christians believe that he's not white either. What is he? Really? Well, he was a he was a Jew from he was a Jew from uh, you know Bethlehem, so he would have been like a, a Semite at the time. I, I I never really thought about you know if that means that he was uh, what kind of hair he had, but we have we have icons of him. We have the shroud of Turin, which I personally believe is authentic, and it's very close to the image of Christ of Sinai, which is from the fifth fifth century. And the images of Christ, uh, which come down from the from in our holy tradition, uh, there's no reason to believe they're not authentic representatives of Christ. So you can see that the image of Christ uh, from Sinai. You probably even have it in your bookstore there somewhere. That's the way Christ looked. Dark. He had darker hair, not black hair, but he had darker hair, and he was a uh, olive skinned, just like ours, and just like our our, our icons right here. Yeah. Well, our icons are coming down generation after generation after generation from the early church. And, you know, with, with iconoclasm, we lost many icons, but there were there were those who preserved on Mount Sinai. And those icons are from pre-iconoclastic period. They're from the 5th century, 4th century. We even have in Thessaloniki, they say, a church from the 3rd century, which shows Christ. So there, there's no reason to doubt, as, from an Orthodox perspective, that we know what Christ looked like. He had longer hair. He had the, he had the just like in the images that you see. But you, you should also look into the shroud of Turin. They've come out with amazing 
computer graphics that show a three uh, based on the Shroud of Turin, they show a three D, um, uh, like a three D image, computer image of what Christ looks like, and it's very close to the uh, image on the Mount Sinai icon of Christ. I actually have seen that as well. That's believe it or not, it's in the Vatican of all places. Mm -hmm. One thing that does not show is just skin color. That's that's uh, that's all. It doesn't one thing that does not show is skin color. That's that's yeah. All that's I don't think that, I don't think any any reason to believe that he didn't have, uh, a, a, you know, a dark uh, a, a, an olive skin kind of Mediterranean look. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Father Peter. It's uh, it's actually good that Theofani mentions these kind of uh, questions because, as we know, the early Christians, many of them were not literate. Whether they had, they had dyslexia like our brother Thelfani, or whether we had uh, other temptations. And so maybe in the future we could have a homily, a series of homilies on iconography um, mm. to bring this down because it's very important that we look at these icons because we pray to the saints in the images of these icons uh, for their intercessions, and especially on the feast days of the saints. We will see their icons there and we venerate them. So it's, I think it's beautiful, uh, your, your, your answer to Thelfani, uh, who has the guts to answer, uh, ask this kind of question. So. Father, Father uh, Peter, this is Yanis. Hello, Yanni. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. Uh, it was very important to hear about the icons. Uh, many, many people, many monks, many priests, many others uh, uh, were killed uh, because they wanted to keep those icons uh, some thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. um, what I wanted uh, to say is that it was is, it was refreshing. Because that's a question I was battling with uh, for for uh, for a number of uh, uh, time now, for a number of weeks, number of months, years. And when you mentioned the fact that uh, heterodoxy was also present in uh, the apostles during the apostles, and it hasn't stopped to this day, uh, I uh, started to read a, a very interesting article that's just been published by a. Uh, uh, theology uh, doctorate uh, on surviving surviving uh, the uh, pseudo synod of uh, Ferrara uh, that was just recently uh, published and, uh, and and it's a very good reminder especially nowadays when we have you know Archbishop uh, I think Demetrios in the states and you know declaring May twenty first uh, a HEPA day and uh, you know different metropolitans uh, doing different things that um, are taking us away from orthodoxy. So it's very nice to to see the forge, you know, for the trees that, you know, um, we're living in, in real tough times, but at the same time, uh, these things have happened. Uh, people have battled all, the, all over the centuries to keep the orthodoxy going. So um, uh, thank you for me mentioning that. And uh, any words to encourage us to keep the faith and to stay strong and, to, and humble? Um, Learning are uh, 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 very much appreciated. Thank you. Well, I think we have to remember that the, the, the enemy of our salvation is not introducing uh, cacodoxy, heterodoxy, or, or a variety of you know wrong opinions for their own sake, but to take people outside the church. So uh, it would absolutely be counterproductive uh, to for for us to throw down our arms and retreat from the battle uh, in the in the midst of this of this war for for the the right uh, Orthodox confession of faith regarding the church, which is what we're living through, it would make no sense in the midst of this uh, this terrible battle for the sake of the the truth. And only on the foundation of the truth can we live our Christian life. So when we when we accept delusion, we're accepting essentially the spirit of delusion is behind that. We're accepting that into our lives, uh, and it's so strong today, and it comes in a, with a variety of, of of packages and philosophies and teachings. Uh, but but all of those uh, have to be compared and contrasted and, and and critiqued on the basis of that which the holy fathers have taught, and only then. Uh, can we understand what is of God and what is of the enemy in each each of these teachings or ideas or philosophies? So we have to acquire uh, our own in our own struggles. We have to make the, an effort to acquire the spirit of God, um, 
and reflect on the scriptures, reflect on the lives of the saints, read the lives of the saints. You know, the lives of the saints are the continuation of the gospel. The church is a continuation of the incarnation, and the lives of the saints is a continuation uh, in every generation of the scriptures. So if we're immersed in those, uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll have eyes to see, uh, and we won't be led away. Um, but so the aim, of, the aim of the enemy is always to lead us away in a variety of, of, of matters. And so he can do that on the left. He can do it on the right. He can do it through liberalism or worldliness, or he can do it through fanaticism or zeal not according to knowledge and we get led into sectarian ideas about the church or ethnicism philatism and we see the church is essentially an extension or, or uh, identification of our ethnic group well the church is greek the church is russian the church is some serbian whatever it is so there's a variety unfortunately our age there's the difference with the t time of the apostle paul or, or the fourth century or the eighth century seventh century with iconoclasm eighth century is the only difference I see is quantity. Why don't we take the next question if anybody has one? Okay, Fanny, go ahead. Um, I, I, first, I have to say Nico's going to hate the fact that I'm asking this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. I, the calendar issue. For ve many, many years, I could never understand why didn't God just appear to these people who made the changes and said, don't do this. But it's, like he allowed it to happen, and now the church is divided. So some people celebrate Christmas on this day. We celebrate Christmas on this day. I actually had a Russian person tell me, we're right, you're wrong. Like, it's just, it's, it's a big mess. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so what the question is, why hasn't God intervened? Like, like God is God. He could have just appeared to these people and said, you know, don't do this. And, but he, he, he allowed it to happen why well god made us free human beings in his image so insofar as we're in his image and we are uh, we are free to accept him or reject him and that's a, a absolute prerequisite for us to love him because if he forced us to accept him that would not be love so freedom is a necessary element if we're going to have a loving relationship with others and with god and if so, if you were forced to enter into a relationship and be married to someone, you would probably not love them. Maybe. But, and if you were forced to do it continually, that would not be a, a, a relationship in which two people lovingly embraced one another. And that's the relationship between man and God. In, and that's what he calls us to. And so we are free to accept it or reject it. So the freedom... That freedom is a tremendous responsibility. It's a shine of our of our being created in the image of God. It, it separates us from all all of other uh, all the rest of creation. And so, what you're what, without knowing it, what you're asking me is why doesn't God force people, or pressure people, or appear to them and scold them? I mean, He's God; He can do whatever He wants. You're correct on that, but there 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 is a tremendous respect on the part of God for our our, our freedom to love him and embrace him. And this is not the first time that people have risen up in the church and created division. So actually your question is not just about the calendar change. Your question is really about every heresy and every schism in the history of the 2000 years of the church. Your question is really about Judas. Well, God knew that Judas, who he was, what he was, and yet he allowed him to be a part of the apostles and he allowed him to choose his path to deny Christ and actually even hang himself. You might ask, well, why didn't God stop him from hanging himself? These are all, you know, questions which fundamentally bring, you know, um, misunderstand the, that we're, that love presupposes freedom. We have to lovingly accept God. Now, in particular, the question of the calendar uh, error, because uh, I do believe it was an error, but why was it an error? Was it an error so much that the church is, is, has a problem with the actual change of the days? Is there is it a theological error that the days were changed and we we we, we went with a, an updated version, which apparently, according to scientists, is closer, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. I don't think that's the main problem. The main problem is might be a problem, but the main problem is that it was done in an anti 
ecclesiological, anti-conciliar manner. Okay? That means that there were decisions made without the fullness and the agreement of all the local Orthodox churches and all the bishops. And it was done for reasons which were not uh, consistent with an Orthodox ecclesiology. So Miletios Metexaichis called his, his, his so-called Pan-Orthodox Council. He was the Patriarch of Constantinople in 1923. Uh, and of course, this, is, this was a question that was being bantered around from the turn of the century. But he, uh, he, he kind of made the jump to have a, quote, Pan-Orthodox Congress. That Congress really was not much of a Congress at all. It was just a few people. I think it was like 20. I can't remember the exact number. But it was just a, one or two from about half the churches and not everybody agreed, actually. There were several people who didn't agree. But in any case, that was the beginning of him saying that we have some kind of basis now to make the change. And he made it unilaterally for the ecumenical patriarchate. And then unilaterally, the Church of Greece, without consulting other local churches. And I think over uh, decades, until like the 1960s, finally, I think the Church of Bulgaria was one of the last that actually changed the new calendar. I might be wrong on this historical data. I'm not, I'm not up on this. But in any case, some churches didn't do it for a long time. And of course, most of Orthodoxy doesn't even follow the new calendar. It follows the old calendar. If you, you know, Russia, um, Serbia, Georgia, the Patriarchate of Jerusalem, and... Um, uh, Poland, I think, just went back to the old calendar, actually, believe it or not, or at least some of most of the Polish churches did. I'm not sure about the church in Czech, uh, Czechia. I think they're on the old calendar. So, but, but the overwhelming majority of Orthodox Christians in the face of the earth follow the old calendar, not the new calendar. So I think that I think the church should, should, should uh, the, 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 when you make an error on that level, it needs to be corrected. And unless it's corrected, the problem doesn't go away. Uh, so I think the ultimate solution to that is that the local churches get together and they go either they go make a common decision to go back to the old calendar or they make a common decision to create something different or whatever but the problem is conciliar and all the churches being involved and uh it's not a dogmatic question in and of itself although it is the beginning of the humanistic mindset so the calendar change it, rightly the, the old calendars can say this was the beginning of humanism it's true it was. The reason they did it was to become closer to the Western confessions and to come closer to Roman Catholicism. So the motivation was, you know, ecumenistic, uh, union without communion, union not in dogma, uniting on, in various ways uh, to, to without regard for the Orthodox Church's unity. So that's definitely an ecumenistic uh, kind of methodology. And so but the, the reaction of the old calendars was also not patristic. So eventually, I mean, eventually. So the departing from communion with others who are on the old calendar or others who are fighting humanism is not a patristic response. There should be working together. They should be struggling together against it. So that division is not produced. So one error produced another, and now we have two. Um, and it really, the... the the departure of the old calendars from the communion of the church, the rest of the church, uh, and the not working together with other other Orthodox is only in favor of the humanistic mindset and error. Doesn't really help. Doesn't really help ultimately to overcome the problem, in my opinion. So I don't know what else, to, how else to, to answer. I mean, there's a two-part answer: the question of freedom, and then the question of what actually happened and what's wrong with it and why it should be corrected. Um, it's a part, it's a, it's a part and parcel of the whole mentality of the contemporary uh, humanistic age. So it's not going to be solved until that's solved, ultimately. Brother Peter, we thank you so much for spending time with us again. Sorry for the few temptations, but uh, we have to expect that. As you said, the main temptations today. I, you yeah. know, the, uh, the, did everybody get to ask a question or we got into more you know secondary issues I, I hope I hope everybody takes the opportunity to ask you know questions that are important to their spiritual life as well yeah unfortunately our, our time uh, is limited today so if we can okay. just for your closing prayers and God willing in the future to uh, hear from you again okay God bless
I don't know. What do you what do you usually close with? Go ahead and chant something, Nico. Thank you.